In parts of Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia, hardship is ever-present. Drought and internal uprisings have destabilized this region for decades. Conflict is never far away. For many, the only way to a better life is on foot, where people scrape every last penny they have together to pay smugglers. The refugees pay hundreds of dollars to get out. Some come by boat, a few by air, but most make a dangerous overland journey crossing Sudan's border with Egypt, then across the Sinai Peninsula headed for Israel. But the tribes of the Sinai are a law unto themselves. The Sinai Desert is a place of close-knit tribes. Outsiders are rarely tolerated, let alone welcomed. The powerful Sawarka tribe control many of the tunnels used to smuggle goods into Gaza, even cars and vans. In the hinterland, trucks use a system of trenches to unload fuel, which will later also end up in Gaza. Even marijuana plantations grow here. The drug will make its way to Israel, Europe, and other parts of the Middle East. This is a place where smuggling and contraband are the economy, a place the Egyptian police rarely dare set foot in. A lawless area with dark secrets. Many refugees who enter the Sinai never leave. Because the smugglers don't take the refugees to the Israeli border. Instead, they sell them to Bedouins in Sinai while they try to extort extra money from the families back in Africa or relatives they may have overseas. Those who cannot pay are enslaved. Many of the women raped. This woman from Eritrea made it to Israel, but she will never forget the atrocities of her ordeal. She asked us to hide her identity. When I traveled from Sudan to Sinai, I was the only girl among a group of men. They did whatever they wanted to my body. She went on to explain that upon arriving in Israel, she realized many other women faced the same thing including many pregnant women who lost their babies due to their harsh punishment. We decided to see for ourselves what's happening in Sinai. We've been invited into northern Sinai by a Sawarka tribal chief. Now, he says we're not going to be able to name him or film him or members of his tribe, and he may not be happy with what we have to ask. We arrive in Al Mehdiya, often described as one of the most dangerous places in Egypt. Only a few kilometers from the Israeli border, a poor, windswept settlement home to smugglers, drug kingpins, and human traffickers. While the camera is off, I ask the chief about the African refugees coming through Sinai, whether they are detained against their will. He makes a startling admission, telling me there are compounds where they're held. He even claimed to know specific compounds that were built with profits from human trafficking. Some refugees are forced to work in the marijuana fields. The tribal chief even acknowledges that women are raped if their relatives cannot pay the massive sums the captors try to extort from them. Our hosts claim they know very little about the people involved in human trafficking, but there's more here than meets the eye. To our surprise, they take us to a compound and produce several refugees from Sudan. What's your, where do you want to go? What's your goal? I want to go to Israel. Why? Because I want to, to work and help my families. They are suffering a lot in Sudan. There. Therefore, I just come here to work and, and send them money to help them. There. And do um, you know it's very dangerous to make the crossing over to Israel? Do you yeah, know how you're going to do it? Do you have any idea how you're going to do we it? Just, we, just, we just want to, to do it. No? There is no way out. No? With the Bedouins keeping a close eye on them, the men claim they're being treated well. It's not clear whether they are free to leave to try and finish their journey. The Sawarka insist only rogue elements among their ranks are involved in forced labor and abuse of the refugees. The Egyptian Organization for Human Rights says it was able to send a fact-finding mission to one Bedouin camp. It found the refugees suffering an appalling plight. This, uh, this, they're facing uh, a harsh treatment and uh, 
uh, sometimes using uh, uh, weapons uh, and shooting them and uh, beating them and uh, raping women. So this is a condition in, in, a, in a camp without any any uh, 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 observation or any uh, uh, governmental uh, uh, follow. As we roam Sinai with the Bedouins, it seems impossible to find anyone here willing to admit such practices. But then we get a lucky break as we travel south to meet another prominent Bedouin. His name is Salem. He's the leader of the Tarabi, one of the largest tribes in Sinai. Salem is a fugitive from Egyptian justice, sentenced to 80 years in jail for drug trafficking. He's taking a risk meeting us, but he says he wants to tell us what really happens to the refugees. The Africans spent time in Sinai while waiting for money from their relatives to be transferred. During this time, the refugees are beaten, tortured and killed. Salem insists that only a tiny fraction of Bedouins are involved in trafficking and slavery. But he agrees they're ruthless. These people only think about themselves. It does not matter where they get their money from. They work with a middleman in Africa who brokers the deals for the smugglers to sell refugees. The refugees have to stay here two or three months, sometimes even six months, waiting on the border. One of them was Yemen Tesfam from Eritrea. He eventually made it to Israel, but his story is similar to many. Tesfam left a wife and six children behind to seek work. After crossing Sudan, he made his way to the Sinai but was seized by Bedouins. When they tortured me, I became wounded, and I was useless to them. And then after that, I paid $4,000 for my release. His legs still show signs of the injuries, and even in Israel, he's finding life hard. The promised land has not been quite what he expected. But he is lucky compared to the fate some suffer, because what I would discover next would prove to be the most disturbing of all.